Well, the reason is that we uh, uh, took the continuum limit. So the original problem uh, was formulated on with a sort of discrete set of atoms. Uh, but then we introduced these interpolating functions. And uh, so uh, I claim that this is the reason for getting an infinity here. Uh, and so um, how to understand this? Well, uh, by uncertainty principle, the momentum uh, uh, should not be uh, uh, larger than, so you see this uh, phonons there, waves propagating uh, through this uh, chain of atoms. So of course, uh, th these atoms are separated by a certain position, which is for the ray. <coughs> Uh, and uh, so we cannot uh, possibly measure the position of, of say, say, wave packet moving through this um, through this array of atoms with an accuracy better than a. So there is an uncertainty in, uh, in measuring the position, and uh, therefore, by uncertainty principle, the uh, momentum of the phonon is bounded from above by h divided by. A. So there is, in fact, in this integral, there should be a cutoff of the order of h divided by. So it is then finite but very big. So uh, again, to understand this uh, in a mathematically precise way, we should, re should have returned to the original problem written over there, where the system was discrete. And then uh, we could have done, uh, well, all the steps, but uh, considering x as a discrete variable, and then instead of, again, instead of, uh, well, integrals will have sums. Uh, Fourier transform will become, again, a, well, a sum. Uh, and the... the mm, Associated, uh, um, as you know, so if you have a lattice system, then the dual momentum, the Fourier momentum, is periodic, right? So if you have periodic interval, the momentum variable in the Fourier transform is discrete. If you have a discrete variable in Fourier transform, the momentum variable will be periodic, okay? So... In practice, uh, the momentum of uh, phonons, <coughs> of lattice waves, they, uh, uh, they are periodic with momentum uh, 2 pi h power over a. So the momentum is confined to a single Brillouin zone. Uh, and uh, if we would have done all the steps without taking the continuum limit, then um, uh, uh, the true dispersion relation for phonons would uh, let's see, let me write it down explicitly. So it will have this uh, form that contains a sign. Uh, so this is a result of the calculation that I don't want to rep reproduce even in, uh, without any details. So anyway, so this is the answer that you would get for a finite discrete array of atoms. Yes? Right. I'm trying to work out the relationship between the the limit on our precision in the measurement of the position of an atom and the maximum value of the momentum. The one thing I'm used to seeing, so if we look at the 
Inequality, if we multiply both sides by A, we have position times momentum is less than or about equal to H bar. Uh, I believe I used the same, the inequality go the other way? Or we, we're just not thinking about this in the right way. Um, yes, that's right. Um, let me see. Um, perhaps this was a bad explanation. I, um, let me think about it. Let's, uh, um, so, uh, Sort of a more precise way to, to understand this is just to redo the calculation for the, uh, for the chain where we treat the atoms as, as uh, discrete points. Then what you get is this formula um, where momentum now runs between uh, minus pH bar divided by A and pH bar divided by A. And that is periodic in P with this period, this order of this period. So, um, if you draw this dispersion curve, Um, so if you draw the dispersion curve, then it starts um, linearly. Um, so, the, uh, it starts linearly at small moment, huh? Uh, so this is the dispersion that we got by uh, approximating the, by doing the continuum limit. The true dispersion relation is actually smaller, so it uh, has the same slope at zero, but then it has this uh, uh, sinusoidal shape. So it's, um, well, it must be periodic in PP, so this point is actually identified as that point. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, here, of course, the uh, integral would be converted, <coughs> right? So we can, first of all, we integrate on a finite interval, and then we integrate uh, actually a different expression. So our approximation is valid only for sufficiently small momentum. Um, so uh, this is the reason why uh, uh, we got this divergence. So, um, then the vacuum energy in practice, it's, I mean, we can write down the exact expression.
So what you see is that um, here A appears in the numerator uh, in the second power. So in this formula, obviously, A cannot be taken to, 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 to zero. Uh, however, uh, we could have, uh, I mean, apart from the numerical coefficient, we could have get, guessed this formula without going back to, to, to the picture where the system is uh, discretized. Uh, because, uh, so we know that this integral should be cut off at this scale. It uh, diverges quadratically, so the expression should be proportional to Cs divided by square a squared and then h bar. And, uh, well, the only thing that we couldn't have gotten by this simple well, way of reasoning is this numerical coefficient. Uh, and even the numerical coefficient can be, well, not in this formula, but in uh, uh, some more physically interesting expressions that can be recovered uh, from uh, by imposing a set of uh, simple physical requirements. So let me talk about that a little bit. Uh, this, well, uh, what... I'll talk about doesn't have uh, anything to do with field theory, uh, but um, it illustrates the sort of ideas that um, underlie the, well, the approximations that are done in, in field theory when we are dealing with infinities. So uh, <coughs> the theory that I'll talk about is called Debye theory. Uh, and it describes uh, the behavior of, uh, well, real uh, crystals in at sufficiently low temperatures with reasonable appro approximation. So, um, well, uh, uh, so in a real crystal, of course, we will have... Uh, I mean, what will change is um, um, is actually there will be very little changes, right? So uh, we don't even need to understand the details of the crystal structure to well to, to understand that there will be phonons in the crystal. Now, whatever this crystal structure is, the result of uh, these steps will be the wave equation, right? Because the wave equation can be derived just from elasticity theory. It doesn't require knowing the details of the microscopic structure. Uh, so we know that um, there'll, there'll be uh, acoustic waves propagating in any crystal. Uh, now, unlike this one-dimensional situation, they, they will have three polarizations because the displacement vector is, well, has three components. And uh, this is enough to understand how the crystal vibrations will behave at low energies, right? Because the, the wave equation is the same, therefore we quantize it in the same way. So uh, in some approximation, a crystal can be understood as a thermal bath of, um, of phonons, uh, which allows to compute say, uh, the heat capacity of a crystalline solid. Um, because we know that the uh, total energy of, uh, well, of uh, the thermal bus of phonons will uh, obey the, um, uh, well, the Planck distribution. Then we, we can do this integral. 
And so the internal energy of crystal vibrations then is given by the Stefan Boltzmann formula. The important uh, point here is the dependence in temperature. So the energy is proportional to the fourth power of temperature. So the heat capacity, uh, which is the derivative of energy with respect to temperature, will grow in the cube of, of temperature. Now, um, can this be, be true for all temperatures? What, what do you think? It would be a good approximation for it. With which range of temperatures this would be a good approximation? Sorry? High temperature. With high temperature. Um, in fact, uh, this is actually a good approximation of low temperature. Now, at high temperatures, we can also get, yes, the answer. What would be the capacity? Yes. So, uh, so this would be a good approximation of low temperatures. Now, at high temperatures, um, <clears throat> indeed, we can sort of imagine that atoms don't talk to each other. So the temperature, the thermal fluctuations are so strong that they are um, overwhelm any potential energy involved in the, in the atomic interactions. So then um, the heat capacity should uh, uh, be the usual, uh, I forgot how is it called, this, uh, the, the law that the heat capacity is equal to the Boltzmann constant times the total number of degree, degrees of freedom in the system. So three, each atom, atom has three degrees of freedom, then there are n atoms. Uh, and so at, at uh, high temperatures, the heat capacity should approach this constant. So um, at low temperatures, the heat capacity is cubic. But uh, this cannot continue, this curve cannot continue indefinitely. Uh, <coughs> So it should somehow turn and approach a constant. Now what Debye did is he constructed a model that describes all of this curve uh, uh, for, for any temperatures uh, using some reasonable approximations. Actually, not using reasonable approximations, but using some physical reasoning that uh, allows to describe this curve with a minimal number of parameters. So the idea of the pi was uh, the following. So in this, at low temperatures, we have phonons. <laughs> uh, well, now they live in the three-dimensional momentum space, dx, py, dz. Um, and, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, we know that at, uh, um, small enough 
momenta, <coughs> they behave as particles with this dispersion relation. So this is definitely true at uh, momenta uh, much smaller than h bar divided by like a space. So uh, for momenta that are bigger than that, or of the same order of magnitude that h divided by a, phonons behave differently. So they, their dispersion becomes uh, somewhat different. So they, first of all, the momentum should be periodic, so it belongs to some Brillouin zone. And uh, the energy is not really linear, but it's, uh, it curves down in, in, in a certain way. So this means that when we quantize phonons, so here we will have equally spaced levels, and here the density of states will be a little bit different. So the density of states for phonons will, we have a, an okay approximation for it at small momenta, but then when momenta become sufficiently large, uh, well, then uh, uh, this will, this curve will really depend on the crystal structure of the solid, how, what kind of atoms it has, what kind of uh, um, crystal lattice it has, etc., etc. So certainly this will be very, very dependent on the details. But uh, the idea of Dubai was to introduce a very simple phenomenological model that takes into account, uh, well, I mean, basic physical principles and our knowledge of uh, uh, physics at small momentum, which is universal, which is the same for all crystals. So he said that let's say that uh, inside uh, a ball of radius uh, 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 lambda, um, uh, let's say, well, lambda divided by CS. So that inside we have usual phonons with this dispersion relation, and outside there are no levels at all. So we just neglect everything that doesn't behave universally. Uh, so uh, this means that we assume that phonons can have energy smaller than lambda. So in this sense, we introduce a cutoff on our energy scale. Um, And then there is nothing outside, which is, of course, a very crude approximation. Certainly photons, uh, well, the Brion zone is not a sphere. Uh, the dispersion curve of a real phonon starts to deviate from this linear, uh, linear universal law much earlier than at the boundary of the Brion zone, etc., etc. But to the first approximation, we neglect all these details. Uh, the only thing that we need to understand is what is this lambda. Well, we know this, that lambda divided by Cs should be of order of h bar divided by a. But typically, we don't know what is a and, uh, uh, well, uh, Besides, uh, uh, there is a, one physical principle that we would like to preserve, right? We want to, uh, uh, we want to, to have the same number of degrees of freedom in our system that, uh, 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 that is, so we want that the number of degrees of freedom in this approximate phenomenological description is the same as in the real crystal that we are we want to study. So uh, we assume that 
that the number of degrees of freedom is, uh, is the same. Um, and so uh, the total number of degrees of freedom is what? This is, is, three, is 3 n. Yes. When you say it's the same, do you mean the same in the lower and higher limits? Or oh, literally the same. So we assume this very simple model of exponents of excitations in the solid. We say that they all sit in this ball of radius lambda divided by CS. And there, uh, the particles satisfy this uh, dispersion relation. That's it. Outside, there is nothing. So on the other hand, we know that the total number of degrees of freedom is three times n, because we have three uh, we'll have n atoms, each can move in three directions. When you say the number of degrees of freedom is the same, it seems like we're comparing two situations, and in each of the situations, in the two situations, the number of degrees of freedom is the same. So I'm just yes. asking is, are those two situations low momentum regime and high momentum regime, or what, what are those two? Oh, so we are comparing our very crude model to the real physical system. So in the real physical system, the total number of degrees of freedom is 3. We are trying to describe this system in a very, very simple way. So we say that we use low energy approximation for phonons beyond, uh, in principle, beyond the regime where it is valid. And then we introduce a sharp cutoff on their momentum instead of um, well, thinking of how the Brion zone really looks like. Uh, so, uh, so then we need to compute the number of degrees of freedom in this model. So, as you know, in each cell in the phase space, there is one degree of freedom. Uh, and so we should multiply, well, the volume of uh, the real space times the volume of momentum space times three polarizations of each phon phonon. And this will count all degrees of freedom. Uh, <coughs> so if we compute this volume, we find that this is equal to the uh, right hand side is equal to V times lambda cube divided by 2 pi squared h bar cube cs squared. Uh, from which we can find lambda. So usually, um, K Boltzmann times lambda, uh, or wait, wait a minute, lambda divided by K, by the Boltzmann constant is called the, and sometimes this is denoted by theta d, and this is called the Debye temperature. Um, and this is typically, this is few hundred kelvins. Uh, so usually what people do is that they introduce this as a phenological parameter. Uh, so it is a little bit, so you see that in this particular way of thinking, it uh, depends just on the density of the crystal. Uh, but for real crystals, one just parameterizes this by one phenological parameter, which is reasonably well, well agrees with this uh, estimate, but uh, typically one introduces this debate temperature, which is different for different solids. Anyway, so then one can uh, calculate the energy of a crystal. 
Uh, so uh, this uh, would be equal to integral over uh, the energies up to the cutoff of the uh, um, uh, plan distribution. Uh, so this integral cannot be calculated in uh, elementary functions and usually one introduces the special notation for it. So this is called the Debye function. I write here, can everyone, everyone should be able to see. Yes. Uh, so in the expression there, 3n equals to 3v integral. So that should be replaced by cs cube in the denominator, not cs squared. Because there is a cube there. Here? No, no, in the, the previous one. Yeah. Okay. So we, we, let's be lambda cube by 2 pi square h bar cube cs cube. Right? Because uh, yes, 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 you yes, have yes, three right. integrals and you take, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, where's the correction? There was a square here which was yeah, wrong. Thanks. It should be cube. So the Debye function is defined as, uh, as an integral. So this is 3 by x cubed, integral from 0 to x dz z cube to the z minus 1. And then the heat capacity is equal to 3 and k Boltzmann uh, times d of x minus x d prime of x uh, at x equal to lambda uh, divided by k Boltzmann times t. And so this uh, uh, is approximately equal to 12 by 4 and uh, k Boltzmann to the 4 t cube divided by 5 lambda cube at uh, k Boltzmann t much larger than lambda or just 3n k Boltzmann at k Boltzmann t much smaller. It's the other way around. So this should be at small temperatures and this is at big temperatures. So indeed, if you draw this curve, I think I did it in, in the notes using Mathematica. So it has precisely this shape. So it starts off as, as cubic uh, uh, curve at small temperatures. So when we know that phonons are good approximation, but uh, then uh, uh, it also it flattens and goes to the constant that we expect it to go to. So by imposing a simple Physical requirements, uh, it is possible to fit this curve and it works pretty well for, uh, as far as I know, for all solids. Uh, um, so the lesson that I would like to draw from this is that uh, uh, in many cases, it's sufficient to know the physics at low energies. So first of all, at low energies, the physics is universal. So the 
sound waves propagate in all crystals more or less the same way for at low frequencies and low wave numbers. So they're just described by the wave equation. And so phonons behave the same way in all, in all sorts at uh, small moment. Now at large moment, uh, they behave differently depending on the microscopic uh, structure. But if you impose the uh, reasonable uh, physical uh, requirements, then we can extrapolate the low energy theory uh, up to the limits where it's, uh, it's not even supposed to work. Mm -hmm. So the way it works here is that we just impose some limiting uh, energy beyond which our approximation shouldn't work. And then the physical requirements allows us to set this uh, uh, energy cutoff to, to express it in terms of the uh, parameters of the, mod the system that we want to study. Um, so I guess I stop here and uh, the next, uh, in the next uh, lecture, we continue with field theory proper.